Hello everyone, I am Mahendran Jayaraj, Assistant Professor of Medicine at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas School of Medicine. I am here with Dr. Rajesh Krishnamurti and we thank GIE for this opportunity to produce this video to discuss our recently published article titled Risk of Progression in Barrett's Esophagus Indefinite for Dysplasia, a Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis. Hello everybody, I am Rajesh Krishnamurti, a Therapeutic Endoscopist at Virginia Mason Medical Center in Seattle. Rajesh. As the lead author, could you explain why this idea was conceived? Barrett's esophagus is a precursor lesion for esophageal adenocarcinoma. The degree of dysplasia is the most widely accepted predictor of progression in Barrett's esophagus. It has been postulated that among most patients who develop neoplastic disease, the intestinal metaplasia transforms from non-dysplastic Barrett's to low-grade dysplasia to eye grade dysplasia and eventually to intramucosal carcinoma. An indeterminate category of dysplasia is often reported by the pathologist as Barrett's with indefinite for dysplasia. While the risk of progression has been well established in low grade dysplasia and eye grade dysplasia, the natural history of Barrett's with indefinite dysplasia remains unclear. There is a wide variation in the reported rates of malignant progression in Barrett's with indefinite dysplasia. The current recommendation for surveillance in patients with indefinite dysplasia is to treat the inflammation with acid suppression for 8 to 12 weeks, followed by endoscopies with repeat biopsies to assess the histologic diagnosis. Since the actual risk of malignant progression in indefinite dysplasia is unclear, Patients with persistent indefinite dysplasia are managed the same way as Barrett's with low-grade dysplasia in clinical practice. This leads to surveillance endoscopies performed at shorter intervals in patients with indefinite dysplasia compared to patients with no dysplasia. Therefore, reliably estimating the risk of progression in indefinite dysplasia is important for both patient care and cost effectiveness. We decided to do this by a systematic review and meta-analysis. Thanks Rajesh, that clearly explains the need for the study. In summary, this study is a systematic review and meta-analysis of studies that reported the incidence of high-grade dysplasia and or esophageal adenocarcinoma as an outcome in patients with Barrett's with indefinite dysplasia undergoing endoscopic surveillance. In this meta-analysis of eight studies with 1,441 patients with indefinite dysplasia, the incidence of high-grade dysplasia and or esophageal adenocarcinoma was 1.5 per 100 person years. The estimated incidence of esophageal adenocarcinoma alone was 0.6 per 100 person years. It is to be noted that the current studies estimates of risk of high-grade dysplasia and esophageal adenocarcinoma in indefinite dysplasia are similar to the corresponding risk estimates previously reported in low-grade dysplasia. Rajesh, what does our study add to the existing knowledge? The current study is the first systematic review and meta-analysis evaluating the risk of malignant progression in Barrett's with indefinite dysplasia. The AGA guidelines from 2011 do not recommend a specific surveillance interval for patients with Barrett's with indefinite dysplasia. The most recent ACG guidelines from 2015 recommend that surveillance in patients with confirmed indefinite dysplasia should follow that of low-grade dysplasia and hence suggest a surveillance interval of 12 months. It is to be noted that the ACG guidelines was based on expert opinion with low level of evidence. The current study attempts to fill this evidence gap. As for estimated progression risk, and indefinite dysplasia or similar to that of previously reported risk in low-grade dysplasia, surveillance intervals in indefinite dysplasia should be similar to low-grade dysplasia. Thanks Rajesh. This study seems to add good quality evidence to the current guidelines. For the benefit of the readers, to critically appraise the study, I would like to list the strengths and limitations of the study. Our study has several strengths including a systematic literature search with well-defined inclusion criteria, a rigorous evaluation of study quality, calculation of incidence rates by person years, and subgroup analysis to assess the cause of heterogeneity. There were some limitations in our study. The analysis was performed assuming that 
the incidence rate is constant over time, which may not be accurate. The included studies reported wide variability in the incidence of indefinite dysplasia with potential for misclassification bias because of inter-observer variability in the diagnosis of indefinite dysplasia. But the confirmation of indefinite dysplasia diagnosis by expert GI pathologists should mitigate this to some extent. Studies did not consistently report their endoscopic surveillance intervals, raising concern for in inter-study differences. While the heterogeneity in the overall analysis was high, subgroup analysis based on study location and study quality explain the heterogeneity to some extent. Rajesh, how does our study change the existing practice and what do you expect to follow the study? The current study provides the best available risk estimates that may be used by gastroenterologists in practice to counsel their Barrett's patients with persistent indefinite dysplasia. While endoscopic therapy is currently a management option for low-grade dysplasia, its role in indefinite dysplasia is not clear given the limitations of the existing data on progression risk in indefinite dysplasia. Based on the current study's risk estimates of progression, patients with indefinite dysplasia should be placed on active endoscopic surveillance after their anti-reflex regimen is optimized. Prospective studies to define the natural history of Barrett's with indefinite dysplasia are needed to confirm our findings.